huge thank you to CIBC for making We Get It possible. Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Karine. I'm the program director with Young Adult Cancer Canada. And welcome to this new episode of We Get It. We Get It comes live on Facebook uh, every Monday night at 7 Eastern. And we also have all our episodes living on our YouTube channel so you can catch up on all the awesomeness you may have missed in previous weeks. Today, uh, I am uh, really happy uh, with my guest. I'm with Marissa Thomas, uh, who is the co-founder of a, a really great organization in the US for the breast of us. Uh, and we're gonna talk about a bunch of stuff that are pretty, pretty neat. Uh, like I was just telling Marissa, I feel like for the breast of us have been existing forever, but it is not the case. So you'll, you'll hear a bit more about the magic they've been doing. To give a context for our um, those who are listening in, uh, today for this recording of We Get It, I am in my back in my home office in the, in the room. I went downstairs for an, one episode, but now I came back upstairs. I got a jean jacket on today. I'm wearing some of my favorite jewelry because I feel like when we've since we've been working from home, you don't get to, you know, dress right. up as much. So I've put on uh, some of my favorite jewelry hair up today because, you know, it is probably day three without showering, yet. <laughs> well, washing my hair. I showered, I showered, Marissa. Uh, so that's kind of uh, where I'm at. Uh, so welcome. So welcome, Marissa. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here with me. Thank um, you for having me. I appreciate it. I know you've been on demand. Like, I know it, we're not the first to <laughs> with, with you guys. So really appreciate yeah. this. Yeah, and I'm I'm in my my home office currently as well. My my little corner of my house that I've set up as my home office. I've been here um, for about almost a year. I started working at home full time back in April, um, and it's been nice. It was an adjustment at first, but it's been nice. Um, like you, it's Wednesday. My hair's up. <laughs> it's been a busy day, yeah. so it's just like, oh, let me just put it up. You know, I'll put a little lip gloss on and make it do what it does, and. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here and talk with you today. Same here. You look great. So you Thank see, you. you know, sometimes we feel like shit or we feel tired <laughs> and then people are like, but you look great. So it's like, hey, good. Right. Um, so yes, we've reached out uh, to, uh, to you. So we had actually one of our colleagues was participating recently. You were a guest in the AYACSM. It's this chat that happens on Twitter uh, mm -hmm. every week. Emily Drake, amazing person, yes. uh, organizes those every week. And so Emily had you as a guest. Yes. And uh, one of my colleagues, so I couldn't listen in, but one of my colleagues did. did and we had you in our little star <laughs> as a name because we have been following your, your work uh, for the rest of us for uh, quite a while. I would say about it over a year now. Okay. And, uh, and after listening in to uh, your Twitter chat with, uh, with Emily, uh, my colleague said, oh man, I can't wait for us. Let's try and really get Mar Marissa uh, if we can. Um, so it's, it's really great. There's a million things I would love to talk to you about, but let's try and, and focus. Um, okay. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, so I mentioned a few times for the breast of us. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this, or, this, this organization, how is this, uh, as this came about? Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, well, For the Breast of Us is one of the first online communities for women of color who have been affected by breast cancer. So all women of color, Black, Asian, Native American, Hispanic, so Black and Brown women. It's, it's a space for us to all connect. I myself am a breast cancer survivor. I'm coming up on five years in June. Um, I was diagnosed at the age of 35 with stage two breast cancer. And at the time when I was diagnosed, there just you know wasn't anywhere for me to connect with other women who looked like me. You know, you could do it in person. Now you can't really necessarily do that in person with the, the pandemic going on. But within my generation, a lot of us aren't really doing, we weren't really doing in-person connecting. And so it was really just looking and searching for hashtags like you do on Instagram or Twitter whether that be cancer, breast cancer, or, you know, young adult cancer, and just trying to find people that you could possibly connect with. 
And, you know, because I couldn't find anybody that I could connect with, I met up with um, my co-founder, Jasmine Sowers, at the Young Survival Coalition Summit back in March of 2019. We both knew of each other from Instagram. That's how we connected because a lot of us started following each other. There was like a little group of us that were following each other. And we both knew that we were going to the, the summit. And so we decided to meet up. And once we connected there in Austin, Texas, when they had it that year, we just started talking and realized we had some of the same concerns and um, issues within, whether it be um, Hispanic or African-American women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, because we are diagnosed with the most aggressive breast cancer. Um, mm -hmm. One of that being triple negative, or we're diagnosed right off the bat with stage four. Yeah. And we just wanted to see how could we connect all these women and have them share their stories the same way how we wanted to get our stories and our journeys out. Mm -hmm. And so that is how for the rest of us we came to be both of us, you know, we brainstormed and we did a lot of working. And so then May of 2019 is when we launched and we launched with, I want to say about 50 stories wow. from all different women, um, just explaining their stories, whether that be what it's like being married and having breast cancer, being a single mom and, you know, having breast cancer or different, you know, maybe they changed their diet or they're eating their all range of different stories. And it's just been continuing to go. And it's beautiful just to see all of these women, not only connecting with each other, but also just sharing their stories and being able to relate to them. Yes. I've, I've spent some time on your website and, uh, and read some stories and they are great and it is great. Uh, I think for us, like we've, we've talked about this a few times and I told you a little earlier, we've come to a place where we've had conversations with uh, people in our community who are black indigenous people of color. And they came to us saying, well, it is hard enough in the healthcare systems so in Canada, I would say like, anyway, some of the information you have, we don't even have access to in Canada when it comes to health and cancer and, and race. Okay. Uh, but ultimately, as we were talking, some people were talking about their stories and saying, well, I don't really see myself when I go on, on the website. I, every, everybody's pretty much white. And right. uh, so we've, we started to have those really super important conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, that, yeah, fair enough. You know what? Sometimes it is not easy or comfortable. It is not about that. For us, it was about to say, okay, we need to do much better about it. Uh, because to your point, we've had people saying, well, pick any pamphlets at the hospital. Right. Now it's pamphlets. The picture on the, on the pamphlet might be someone, a person of color, a black mm -hmm. person, or, but in general, when it comes to scarring, when it comes to how your skin looks, when there's a rash after radiation, when it comes to all of those things, people are right. saying, I can't even find that anywhere. Right. Uh, even less and talk about. A, right. And that was a big thing for me too, just going in to have reconstruction surgery, seeing the pictures that they have, you know, there's nobody with skin color that looks like mine. So I don't know what this is necessarily going to look like for me. And that's a really big thing, especially when you're trying to develop uh, repertoire with a surgeon who is going to be cutting on you. You want to make sure that they know, not only that they know exactly what they're doing, but what they know, what your skin's going to look like afterwards, or do they have to refer you over to a dermatologist yeah. that's going to help you in case you keloid or if you scar a different way and this dermatologist knows about brown or black skin. So it's just, it's those little things that turn into big things that a lot of people don't really realize, especially if you aren't you know, a person of color, or if that's just something that you don't have to deal with every day. Absolutely. I think in conversations we've had, even for, with health professionals, I, you're totally right. I don't think anyone, I don't think in general, it's, it's for, we don't give a shit or we don't care, but they don't think about it. So ultimately right. cancer is cancer. Well, really for us anyway, and I'm sure you can relate. Well, when you're a young adult, cancer is not worse, but it is definitely different because of the stage of life you're in. And right. then you add other intersectionalities where, where when it comes to race and when it comes to culture and belief and it can get, the stress level can get much higher if you feel like, well, I'm not really getting the information I need and I don't know where to turn. And everybody in my care team is white. Uh, right. so I'm not quite sure. And then for some people it was like, well, I don't even know if I can talk about it or if I feel mm -hmm. comfortable talking about it, like feeling right. safe 
that you're going to be heard and respected and so all of those things so that's why even more your site i think and the work you're doing is truly awesome to focus on stories um, so that's one of the things so as we were listening to you and following you one of the things that we really loved is how you were speaking of how important stories are uh, yes. when it comes to visibility when it comes to inclusion uh, can you can you expand and talk a little bit about that you know just stories in general are just really important yeah. and being able to connect with those stories and relate to them is a really big thing and it's one of the things that we're doing you know over at for the breast of us it's just getting collecting all these stories from all different you know women of color and all different walks of life no matter where they may be uh, where they live, where part of their life that they're in, and just being able to share and relate to those women. You know, we have a private Facebook group called Breast Cancer Baddies, and there's about over 700 women in there mm. who have been affected um, by breast cancer in some way. And just being able to hear them even just post about, you know, their journeys thus far or having questions about maybe what their skin may look like after radiation and having other women just, you know, be frank with them and tell them exactly what that's going to be. It's, it's been amazing. And, you know, even sharing your story, it's a, it's a form of therapy, right? Because you get to just basically word vomit all of that out, whatever's in your head. And so it doesn't stay inside of you because especially going through something like chemo is, you know, very traumatic. It's its own trauma yeah. in that instance. And so being able to get all of that out and not let it sit in and fester with inside of you is a really big thing. And then also not only are you getting that out and so you're helping yourself in a form of therapy, you're also helping any other women who are going through the same thing or who may come behind you because then they can read that and say, okay, well, that's cool. I can relate to this. I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. And I always say, whether you touch two people or 200 people, you're, you'll still make a difference regardless. Absolutely. Like we have a profile section as well on our site and a lot of people will say that's the first place they went on the site because if you're if you've never really connected with other people young adults let's say young women or young adults in general who have cancer a lot of people will say i i thought i was doing it wrong or that i was not normal or that i was not getting better quick enough for my right. age for the expectation so all of those things when they find stories and they can read that's where they go and then they read and the feelings of feeling normalized almost in your experience to say, okay, I'm not alone uh, dealing with all of this and there is a way out. And so being able to relate in that way is super powerful. Right. And like you said, just making it personalized because a lot of the information you're already getting is kind of black and white and sterilized because you are getting it from whether it be from a healthcare professional or if you're going onto a certain site and you know they're spewing out all of these facts, which is all good information to have. But we live in a time now where people want to have a personal connection with other people. And you know, that's kind of how social media is made, right? That's why people share a lot of their lives on social media. So you can have that personalized connection with them. And so stories is just another way to do that, to have a personalized connection with somebody else. Yes. Absolutely. And we, yeah, we love uh, those pieces because I think it's at the core of everything. And you know what, when you have stories to back up the experience, I think you can actually get a whole lot of people understand very differently what it is to have cancer, what, it, what people go through, because people remember stories way more than they'll remember details. Right. Um, specific medical information. It's like, tell me your story. And I think, yeah, that there's so much power lying in there. We will include at the end of our chat uh, ways for people to be able to contribute if they want to contribute their stuff yes. to your site. We'll make sure to, to share that. Um, we've touched, so we've touched on a few things, but I was, so I was browsing and talking about stories and gathering knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things for me, uh, so in the last, mostly in the last year, we've really kind of shifted our lens and paid way more attention to how we provide and support uh, our community members who are Black, Indigenous, people of color in mm -hmm. the community, and also the LGBTQ plus community. Like we've kind of just disability, trying to kind of open our minds way more. 
And I started to do some research. I was reading some of the stuff you, you have shared and I was doing some research for Canada to kind of just try and find anything about right. the situation. And there was not a whole lot. And one of the things that came very strongly is how right now, still the data collection when it comes to race and cancer, so different type, different race, different, there is not a whole lot in Canada. Uh, okay. And some people are really starting to talk about this much more. Researchers are saying we need to do a lot better in gathering information because yeah. I was reading on your site, like even when you look at breast cancer in women for Black, Hispanic, age, the numbers are striking, Marissa. Yeah, they it, are. It's like, uh, okay, it really <laughs> pause for a moment and say, why the fuck aren't we better here? I'm hoping some of this is going to change. Um, but this is a real thing. So as I was reading some more, one of the things, so for young adults, uh, one of the things that we've known and one of the forgotten facts that we've often said uh, was around clinical trials and how uh, to this day in Canada anyway, uh, access to clinical trials by young adults and clinical trials built for the young adult population in mind uh, was really low. Like I don't have the percentage in my head, but it's still to right. this day lower than any other group of cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And then I go and read some of the stuff you have been bringing forward and reading that the 82.9% of people accessing clinical trials are white in the United yeah. States. Uh, it is to me another really good example of how are we supposed to learn and understand and treat and care better for all people right. when those numbers are, you know, the difference is wild. Have right. you been doing any, like, how has this been? Because I know for the rest of us, there's awareness. Have you mm -hmm. done any pushing in that, um, around that topic? Uh, we have, and we're actually participating in a project right now um, that should be coming out live pretty soon here, kind of wanting to talk about what are the reasons why women aren't participating in clinical trials or what are some of the barriers to those things. But um, when, it, when it comes to clinical trials and research now, one of the things that we have proven so far is that, you know, a lot of providers may say like, oh, well, you know, black and brown people don't want to participate in clinical trials. And it's like, no, that's a generalized statement. That's not, that's not true. There may be some of us and there are, we have definitely good reasons why we don't. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, let's dispel some of those things. But at the same time, one of the things that for the rest of us has proven is that that's not true because we do have researchers that reach out to us and say, hey, can you disseminate this information about this clinical trial um, or this research opportunity within your private Facebook group? And as soon as we you know, post about it, women are signing up for it. And so it's more so of translating that information to people and having them more informed. You can't necessarily just throw, okay, well, here's this clinical trial, you should participate. It's like, okay, well, give us more information. What is it about? What, what are we doing? How am I, how do I have to participate? You know, a lot of these research and clinical trials, sometimes it's just taking a survey that you may need to do. Um, and, you know, a lot of us didn't really know that. And so being able to give that information to women and people and have them understand, and, you know, they want to participate because we are, like I said before, the ones who are unfortunately, you know, being diagnosed with stage four cancer and then, you know, unfortunately sometimes passing away. And so it's like, how do we get to that point to where we aren't, the numbers aren't so high. And also going back to, it's like, we don't necessarily want to just research women who have already been diagnosed. We need to be researching people before they even get to this point, because you want to stop it before they are even diagnosed. But if you're already researching people who have been diagnosed, you're only going to get so many numbers. Mm -hmm. So being able to reach out to the other populations as well and have them participate too. Absolutely. Because that brings us to, you know, conversations around prevention and how, how is that in history been inclusive enough so that people feel like it could be them. Like, you know, sometimes messages have been built in a certain way. And I would say even for the subgroup of young adults in general, a lot of what has been circulating around cancer prevention 
sometimes either points at young adults in a negative way where right. young adults, they don't have a good, healthy lifestyle or whatever the prejudice could be. Uh, mm -hmm. But other times it's really kind of, you know, narrow-minded in the messaging. And right. then to your point, if your experiences with the healthcare system are none or minimal or not with a trust element in it, why would right. you blindly sign up for a clinical trial that you know nothing right. about? I wouldn't, you know? Right. <laughs> exactly. And just being able to have the basis of like what good healthcare is or having a good repertoire with your healthcare team. And so that way you are comfortable in wanting to ask certain types of questions or participate in different things, whether that be a clinical trial or if that's just, you know, participating maybe in a volunteer opportunity that they have there. So there's all different types of realms, but being able to set that foundation first. Mm -hmm. And so that way you do have a good, you know, history with the people that are going to be taking care of you. Yeah. Totally. And you mentioned, so one of the thing I know you speak of is around navigating the healthcare system. And I know our healthcare systems are a bit different between the States and Canada, but still, there is still that notion of often I'll say, I've, I've said it in previous episodes, but when you're young, um, often when cancer happens, it's uh, a lot of the times a first experience so immersed in the healthcare system. So you don't know how it works. Right. Um, so what are some of the things, maybe some of the ways you've learned and things you share when it comes to navigating the healthcare system? Well, I'm fortunate enough in that I work in healthcare. So I know how to navigate the healthcare system. I've been working in healthcare for at least over the past 15 years. Yeah. So for me, I'm not necessarily the norm because I know how to navigate the ins and outs, but just, you know, explaining to other people or showing them the way that they can, it's definitely, you know, realizing that you have a voice and making sure that you use that voice and ask whatever question that you have. Like I said before, having a good relationship with your care providers. And even if it is, even if you feel like you can't get through to your doctor, maybe speaking to the nurse or the medical assistant and, you know, talking with them because really they're the ones that actually help drive the care. Like the doctor's there, but the doctor does listen to, you know, his care team mm -hmm. to see what they have to think. And because they are the first line people that deal with patients, whether not necessarily the doctor, uh, when it comes to insurance and finance, just letting people know, you know, down here in the States, a lot of, especially where I live in Washington state, a lot of the big medical offices, they have to, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. They, <laughs> they have to give you forms so that you can apply for financial assistance. And I know a lot of people have this stigma when it comes to that, because they're just like, oh, there's, you know, I don't need this. And I'm just like, hey, if they give you a 50% discount, like, why are you not taking it? <laughs> you know, it's better than you having to pay $500 out of pocket when you could just pay 250. And so it's just being able to tap into those type of resources, because a lot of these medical offices have you know, charity care or people that donate money to help with that type of thing. And a lot of times it just sits there because a lot of people don't apply for it and it's just there for you to use. I mean, you have to do paperwork, you have to do some work on your end, but in the long run, it's like, how is that going to benefit you? If you just do this paperwork right now and be able to get those resources, that's going to help you in the long run. And it's more so just, you know, communication. I think a lot of people, mm. especially in black and brown communities, we come from a place of like, you know, whatever the doctor says is right. I shouldn't ask any questions. I shouldn't push back on that. And, you know, doctors, they're awesome. I work with a handful of doctors I have for a long time. And, but everybody makes mistakes. Everybody's human. And if you have a question, you should definitely ask those questions. And if you feel like you can't ask your healthcare provider those questions, then they probably shouldn't be your healthcare provider. You know, there's one thing that me and my cousin, we always say, and we laugh about, it's like, there's like two people in the world that you should always tell the absolute honest truth to, and that is your lawyer and your doctor. Those are two people <laughs> that you should not lie to. They should have all of your information because at the end of the day, they are definitely going to go to bat for you. So if you're going to see your doctor and you're going to see them for a cough, but then you also have a headache, but you don't say anything about the headache, then how are they going to address both of them if you're not saying anything? Yes. Absolutely. Like communication is, is key. And to your point, that's true. Like I, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, you know, the, the, um, 
often again when young adults get diagnosed like it's at this time of life where often you're independent and you're kind of in your thing and so all of a sudden to find yourself in a place where you might be needing more help and having to ask for more help it is often not the time of life where that's where you are you know and and that can be really hard and what we've learned so we did a big study and we have like some numbers that show how hard young adults are hit financially uh, mm-hmm. and you know what in the states like I don't even want to go there in the sense that I know <laughs> the cost of health care and insurance and, and kind of covering and again when you're young you may not have had the work experience to actually have those right. types of coverage so there's a bunch of layers uh, that I think it's really important to ask and to maybe try and let go of the shame that right. you put on yourself for needing help and it's like take it it's mm-hmm. hard enough to go through cancer right take what can be given to you i am curious and if you don't want to talk about it, it's like totally cool but i am curious as you as a healthcare worker mm-hmm. uh, for 15 years and then going through cancer i'm yeah. guessing you are going through cancer working as a healthcare has yeah. that been has, how has that been to be on both sides sides of the fence i guess Um, It's been interesting, but it's also, it's been good too, because you do get to see what both sides of that is like. You see how the patient is treated, the process and the hoops that they have to go through. And then also being on the healthcare side and knowing, like I said, how to navigate it, what types of questions to ask, um, who to ask for, who to talk to. Uh, But to me, it's a beautiful thing. I actually wish a lot of, (laughs) not that I don't wish that healthcare providers had to have like a life-threatening illness, but just for them to have to go through that and see what it is. Because I think when you're only used to being in one position, you never get a chance to see it from the other person's side of view. And that's kind of just going in the same perspective of like, you know, white people going into black and brown people's shoes and how they have to navigate life in general. It's, It's the same principle. It's like being able to jump on this side and see exactly what it is a day in my life in the shoes that I'm wearing and what you would do to change it because there's certain things that I probably wouldn't do that you would do or you know vice versa but being able to sit in that especially as a healthcare provider and then saying okay well this is how patients feel this is how they may not want to you know approach this certain treatment or why they're asking these type of questions so being able to have that perspective um, it's it's been a beautiful thing i can see that I can see that. And funny enough, I'm like, well, just by saying what you just said, we're tying it back to to stories in the sense that, yes, there is a level of trust and communication and leap of faith in some ways to to Mm -hmm. open up, open yourself up to learning about a different experience. But ultimately, without uh, stories, it, like I've learned so much even in the last year because I focused on it even more. But in my life through reading about other people's experiences where as much as I would have wanted to try and imagine, no way in hell, I can't, you know, it's not, I'm not going to fake it. I'm freaking white. I'm, you know, (laughs) cisgender, like women and in my background and I've had my life challenges, but there's Mm -hmm. a whole list of things that if I don't get access to reading and not to put the burden on other people, but to kind of read and understand and in our healthcare system, I think you're absolutely right to, to have, we have a bunch of people in our community who have like you, they, they're healthcare workers or they work in the healthcare system and then they've had cancer and right. learnings were vast about, yeah. huh. And you know, there's a, it's a vulnerability in sharing your story. You know, even for myself, I was very private during when I was going through my treatment and didn't want to share it with anybody. And then just being able to basically take off that mask and, you know, open myself up to the world, you know, it's scary to do. And especially within like my community, you don't talk about being sick or anything because it's, it's a sign of weakness. And so it's just something that you don't do. And I've heard a lot of other women um, say the same thing. It's just, it's something that you just don't talk about. So that's another beautiful part of that is that women are coming out and doing that. And I want to also give them their props for being able to do it. And I always try to tell people like, definitely like comments, you know, give them 
tell them, you know, thank them for them sharing their stories because you don't know how hard and big of a thing that that was for them to actually shed that part and let you in into like their deepest, darkest thoughts that they may have thought they never would. And, you know, we still encounter some women who are just like, I'm not ready. And that is totally okay. I'm all about meeting people where they're at. I'm not going to push you to tell any part of your story, whatever, whether that's cancer or whatever it may be until you feel like you're ready and maybe you're never ready and that's okay. But there's also other stories for you to read. So then you would still, still feel like you're connecting with somebody. Yes, because, you know, vulnerability is for, for some people, I know it's different for everyone, but it's hard to go there and then to open yourself up. Like, you know, people go through stuff. So then when you come from a culture where it's not the way, it's not encouraged, it's not, you know, it's not people, you need to talk about your feelings and this is how to do it. Right. Uh, yeah, like I five because uh, <laughs> yeah. it is hard. It is really hard. Uh, it's hard in general, I think, for people to share their pains and fears. But right. I think uh, there are some, uh, again, layers where it's like, well, add, add a layer of challenge <laughs> there and then think about that, um, right. which makes it really powerful, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it I'm, does. In your group, like 700 women, so I imagine it, it, quite, it must be quite active. In, uh, in It is pretty active, yeah. And, you know, it's just great. It's great that they feel like they have an open platform that they can ask any type of question and not feel judged or even just watching some of the women who have been able, you could tell that they have become friends or connected offline or just, you know, outside of the group at least. And so that's, you know, that's one of the things that we definitely wanted to do. It's just connecting them all together and being able to, even there's some women who like, they may pop up and they've been in the group for a while and they're just like, oh, you know, I've never said anything, but I'm feeling like, you know, now I want to introduce myself. And like, that's cool too, because then you also get women who comment under and they say, you know, you're doing amazing. You know, they're liking and loving their posts. And just even that, you know, is a vulnerability, right? Because you're having to come out, even if you're in this private group, but you still don't know what eyes are watching you. You still may feel like somebody's going to judge you, but then you actually, you know, come out and you say, hey, this is who I am. This is my story. And then to have other women cheering you on. I know it's, it's got to be an amazing feeling. Yes, totally. We have a Facebook group as well. And there's a whole lot that happens in there that I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, people are pretty amazing. Yeah. To... So I guess to close, so obviously like in half an hour, like there was no way in hell we could just touch <laughs> on everything. But as we were talking, like I always think of, okay, if, if there's anyone listening in and watching and thinking, well, why, well, well cancer, can isn't it cancer, this cancer, and if you're cancer and you're young and why is there a reason and a need to offer spaces like the, the space you're offering? Uh, I think so in some of the stuff I've read and followed from uh, For the Breast of Us, you spoke about privilege uh, in a way that I felt as I was reading how you've explained it to me, it was like, yeah, that's well put and, and put in a way that actually opens up possibilities of understandings and communication and conversation instead of closing it back down. Right. Do you want to, can, could you speak a little bit about what is privilege? What are, why are we talking about this? Sure. You know, it goes back to me even being working in the healthcare system. And one thing that I try to tell people is that we all have a privilege. Uh, just saying that you have privilege doesn't necessarily mean that you're white. Everybody has a privilege. It just depends on what type of privilege you have. Mm -hmm. So for myself, and for example, like I work in healthcare. So my privilege is, is that I can call the doctor that I work for today and if I have an ailment and he will answer me back with whatever I have. And that's my privilege. And I always tell people, I don't take that lightly because I know that there's other women who don't have that access. You know, as soon as I found my lump, I was able to call the medical office that I used to work at and they got me in the next day. Mm -hmm. And then they were able to get me in the following day for a mammogram. And then by that Friday for a biopsy, most people don't have that. And so that is my privilege. My privilege is, is that I work in healthcare. And so I know that because of the relationships that I have developed with people that I have worked with or that I work with right now, I know that that is going to help me get a little bit further than somebody else would. 
-hmm. you know, even yourself, right? If you were here and we were going through the same thing, I would, because I know these people and I know the people that I work with and they know other people, I will probably get to move a whole lot faster than you would through that system. Yeah. And so that's my privilege. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't take that lightly, but I also want to make sure that the other people who come behind me or who are around me have that same type of access as well. Mm -hmm. And so until they can get that same type of access, I can't look down on them because I have that privilege. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that people have to realize. It's like, whatever your privilege is, that is your privilege that you have, but you can't look down on the other people because they don't have that same type of privilege. What you should be doing with your privilege is trying to open that door so then we all have that same type of access and privilege. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why spaces like For the Breast of Us have been developed. So then that way women have that same type of open access or they can share their stories, or they can do referrals within each other. So then that we all have that same privilege and access together. Yes. And there's so much more, like, I feel like we could do like an entire episode just on privilege. <laughs> of course, in the last year specifically, but there has been all kinds of conversations as I'm sure you, you know, uh, and then white privilege. And so we, we won't have time today to get into that. But to me, I felt it was beautiful because, um, like I said, it's kind of sometimes it's an invitation for all of us, regardless of race and but to look into what are my privileges, being right. privileged in some ways, regardless of if it is related to our skin color or it is because of where we work, it is because of the people we know, it is because of our social class or all of those things have an impact on right. how we can have access to support, mm -hmm. how we can feel safe in, in right. that supportive space, all of those things. So I feel like the more we can become aware and mm -hmm. comfortable with where we are in our life with the privileges we have, the more we can actually be there and show up for people around us who might not have the same privilege. Right. Right. And so we can all navigate the world the same way, you know, and I mean, I guess I'll take that back. I won't say navigate the world the same way, but be able to have the same path, yeah. regardless of however you're going to navigate it. Yes. Well, yeah. So I, I, I hear you. Mm -hmm. Marissa, I, I would <laughs> talk a lot more, but uh, I will. Yeah, I, I love this. We should definitely do it again. Shouldn't we? I feel like we could talk about a lot of things. Uh, yeah. I'm pumped that we got to connect today. I'm super grateful. Uh, I love the work that uh, you do for the rest of us. Uh, so you. if people wanted to share their stories and visit, I'm going to put the website uh, here with the video. Yes. Uh, is there an easy way for them to be able to connect with uh, the organization? Yes, of course, on social media. We are on pretty much all the social media channels. So Facebook, we are on, you can just find our page for the breast of us. If you are a woman of color who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, you can live anywhere in the world, no matter your age. You can find our private Facebook group, just search for breast cancer baddies and our private group will come up. We're also on Instagram at for the breast of us and we're on Twitter at the breast of us. So you can find us on any of those platforms and you have any questions for us, please email us at hello at breastofus.com. And like you said, we are accepting stories. We're always accepting stories for women from anything that you want to talk about, whether it be a change in your diet, dating, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever you would like. Um, for the month of March, we are talking about different like healthcare hacks. So if you have any healthcare act hacks that you would like to share, please do that. And you can share those easily on our website. I know Karine will put the link down. So that way you can share it with us. We would love to highlight you on our website and on our social media. So please submit your stories. This is awesome. I love that this is international and and for us anyway, just so you know, uh, for us at YAC as an organization, we have uh, so appreciated the work that you do, not only because of the importance of it, but also for us, because we were very aware that at the moment, for all kinds of good reasons, we don't have a whole lot of our community members who are Black and people of color, Indigenous, who have felt like they wanted to share their stories in mm -hmm. relation to their their race or their different experiences but until we do for us we're able to share some of the stories you're bringing forward so hopefully yeah. we're hoping at yak to also grow 
to have a much more accurate uh, voice of the young adult population in Canada. But until we get there, it's going to be a work in progress. We're working at it every day. Uh, yeah. But ultimately, the work that you do is helping us uh, be better and do better. So we're super grateful for that. So thank you so Good. much for yes. doing this. Thank you. I really, I really appreciate it. I had a great time. So thank you for having me on. Same here. Thank you everyone who could join us tonight. Hopefully you've enjoyed as I do every single Monday. I remind myself and anyone who could use it to just breathe. Remember to just breathe. Take deep breaths throughout your day as you need when things are going well or when things are not going so well. There is so much that can be said in the value of us remembering that our breath can bring us back right here, right now, and help us maybe get a little bit of clarity for, for what we need to do next. So that's my little reminder for today. Thanks again, Marissa. Loved Thank it. You. And we will see uh, you all next Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern on Facebook or YouTube. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.